Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, last year, I showed you um, the Apple II GS build pipeline uh, based around Orca and Gold Golden Gate. I have made some updates to that, mostly just to feed errors uh, from the compiler back into Xcode. So if you mistype something, you'll get an error message right on the line where it occurred. Uh, it's pretty cool, but I don't have time to show that. I'm going to show you <laughs> some 8-bit stuff. So let's create a C project. This is using um, CC65. And we're, we're going to build some 8-bit stuff. So here's, let's uh, collapse that down. Is that big enough? Or I can make that bigger. Um, so we can build and run. And it'll do a build. It'll produce a, a disk image, load it up in virtual two. And in a moment, there we are. Hello world. So that is the basics. Let's do something more than basic. So this is new. Um, let's turn on the high res graphics driver. So that's all we need to do. We save that and rebuild, it'll have linked the high-res graphics driver in. And there's a little bit of boilerplate that you need So we'll, in your code, so let's, let's put that in. So we need that. We also should include the Apple II header. Oops. Okay, so that builds. Um, so let's do some graphics. So the first thing you need to do is you need to install the graphics driver. Did you notice that? That was code completion. Okay, A2, oh, there's the high-res driver. Some code completion there. Um, uh, we need to init it. And when it's all done, we need to uninit it, or uninstall it. And it's all, all this nice code completion. Um, here, let's put in uh, TGI. Let's, let's output some text. Now we've got arguments. So 20, 20, hello, Kansas Fest. How's that? And just for fun, let's draw a circle. Oops, circle. At um, 100, 150. Save that. Let's build and run that. Let's see how that works. Um, just like Orca, you can put in some bugs. Let's put in a bug here. Let's build that. Oh, too many arguments. There's two bugs here and undefined symbol. So, and, and uh, yeah, save, build. So there's that. So that's the, uh, the main new stuff. Um, but I have something else that I'm going to release. One more thing. Uh, that I'm going to release. Am I done? Well, I've got time for one more thing. Um, so this is going to be released later today. Let's restart Xcode and let's create a new project. So I just reinstalled the, the, the type build pipeline. Apple II basic project. That's new. So here's my basic project. Let's get rid of that. Here's some basic code. Let's build and run that. So this uses the basic organizer by the same people who uh, brought us Apple Commander. To So it takes the text, turns it into tokenized basic, installs it with o uh, Apple Commander, and there we are. Let's, uh, let's add a little something. Go to, hey, look, it's even autocomplete in go to there. That's, that's, that's what I want. 100, oops, 100. Save, build, run that. Am I out? You got 30 seconds. 30 seconds? I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to do one more build after this, too. <laughs> there we go. Uh, list. So there's a code. Here's one neat feature of the basic tokenizer, which I've enabled. Optimization. Where is it? There it is. So we'll uncomment that line. OK, well, we'll uncomment more, more of it. 
build and run that. That's turning on the optimizer. And it's actually taking the basic program and filtering out uh, comments and a bunch of other stuff. It's actually going to turn that into a one-liner. It's just magic. Nice. That's not my magic. but And that's it. So that should be available later today. And um, all of it will be on my new website, randomonium.com. Um, which is blocked, considered malware by Rockhurst. Sorry. <laughs> That's well it. Done. Yeah. 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 So if I haven't been too obnoxious about it this week, um, you've probably heard uh, hello? that I'm working on uh, a fun little... Uh, you know what's going on here? Virtual 2. There's Virtual 2. Okay. Um, fun little um, low-res game called Jumpy Guy, and uh, I thought I'd share a little bit of the progress that led me up to uh, actually having a little guy that jumps. Um, so my one of my ideas uh, before I um, started doing anything in low-res graphics was to do a, uh, a Minesweeper clone. And from that, I learned how to put, uh, basically put characters on the screen and worked a little bit in mouse text. So uh, you've got blank uh, squares here, and it sort of auto-completes which squares are blank. And it tells you, like, you know, the classic Minesweeper game, how many neighboring squares have, uh, have bombs in them. And you uh, mark it with an M, and uh, so yeah, it's a you navigate with I J K and L, and then you mark a mine with a with a with an M, and then if I hit a mine, uh, you lose. Press R to reset. Boom, oh, reset. Uh, escape to quit. So from there, I was thinking, well, I can put text on the text screen. I can put um, pixels on the uh, the low-res graphics screen. So, uh, and I was already finding the nearest neighbors in the screen and uh, counting them. So I thought I could do um, a uh, Conway's Game of Life sort of thing. So that's what this is, and it, it, the algorithm is different from Conway's because it's um, uh, just uh, it's different. <laughs> uh, because I tweaked it until it gave me some some more interesting um, different kinds of shapes and things that evolve over time um, and it never really gets very stable because there's all these um, edge conditions and things and so it kind of grows and shrinks and grows and shrinks um, so it's kind of it's it's a nice kind of organic thing and you can tweak the the algorithm with I J K and L to either feed to the you know, feed the cells or starve them, and they kind of live longer or shorter, and it kind of changes the way the, the thing grows and shrinks. Okay. Uh, so finally, uh, I was able to put sprites on the screen with, uh, I was able to put pixels on the screen, so then I put sprites on the screen. Um, uh, I'll share this one. Uh, this one is um, procedural animation, so I draw pixels along the top kind of at random and then I go through the page and if it's a white pixel it becomes a blue pixel and moves down and so you get this nice rain effect and then finally jumpy guy so he runs and he jumps and that's what he does <laughs> And then he dies if he runs into things. Uh, so all of this and the source code for a lot of it is on my GitHub page. And uh, if you can get uh, a high score of above maybe 50, and that's pretty tough, you get a special uh, Easter egg surprise. So if you take a screenshot of it and send it to me, you get my eternal gratitude. Thank you. Hi everybody. 
So um, that's me in the right corner uh, with a kamunga on my head. Okay, bouncing kamungas. So I prepared this for educators, but really, if anybody knows any kid that needs something better to do, they can do this. Okay, so um, what I built is a no slot MIDI interface, and uh, this is what it does. Um, so there's a spec in a standard MIDI spec, so uh, get the student to search for that online. And uh, basically what I'm taking is an enunciator output, putting it through two inverters, which is on a hex inverter chip, and then the 220 ohm resistor going to pin five of a MIDI socket. So you can get uh, these little MIDI sockets from SparkFun, put it on a breadboard, or make your own. Um, okay, and then the plus five volts goes to a 220 ohm resistor to pin four. So it's a current loop, which is driving a MIDI input circuit, which is really a photo transistor. So it's, it has to be, the polarity is important. It has to be like an LED, and ground goes to pin two. Um, let me just push this, yeah. So, um, I built it all on an internal game socket, but um, if you just want to use one wire, you connect it to the enunciator, and you could use the plus five and ground on an external line pin din cable to the back of the 2E uh, joystick connector. Um, you could use any enunciator, but um, be careful if you use enunciator three, because you double high-res graphics uses that, and uh, enunciator two goes high on reset, but this could also be combined with David Schmink's SD FAT uh, Arduino circuit, which is a, a six wire interface to a data logger shield, which takes an SD card onto an Arduino, and it uses an SPI protocol. Uh, quite amazing that it works. And um, so if you're using that, you can use Enunciator 2 for MIDI, and 0 and 1 are used by that. And, um, on a 2GS, it needs Enunciator 2 because there's no C040 strobe, so use Enunciator 3 on a 2GS. Okay, so what you want to do is teach kids how to build this circuit. So there's plenty of electronic kits out there to teach them digital logic, but all they really need to know is what is an inverter and what is a buffer. A buffer is two inverters. And you want to teach them how to use a logic probe to test the enunciator outputs out the apple. So you want to start simple. You really just want to start by getting all the pins out if you're doing it, uh, just an introduction, uh, you could use Arduino headers to a breadboard, or um, I have a 16-pin uh, uh, cable to a breadboard. I, I'll show it. anyone who wants to look at that later. Okay, so you want to test your LEDs first and teach a Ohm's law how to put a current-limiting resistor on a 5-volt output, and then uh, get each LED to turn on and off with these soft switches. So if they could do that, they're on their way. And uh, what you want to do is take it one step at a time. Build a little, test it with a logic probe, build some more, retest. And you can do other things with uh, photo cells on the joystick inputs, whatever you want to do. Uh, there's push button inputs. Okay. So then we need to do that inverter. And there are several alternative TTL chips that you could use. Uh, the hex inverter is nice because you get six inverters. Um, the quad NAND. Um, you connect uh, both um, inputs together and you have an inverter or a quad nor the same thing. And um, so the fun part is what if you have wire it opposite from the spec, nothing works. So you want to get the kids troubleshooting what, what they did. One minute. Yeah, okay. So um, I, I'll, this is online. So you test the interface and there's ideas for independent study and other projects on my GitHub. Um, so. I want to just uh, do a demo, so um, I'm going to put my GitHub page up here, so, and I'll play the music. Okay, ten, yep, okay, and start the music playing. And uh, I need to put the microphone here. On that Apple II, you'll see. Uh, let's do. Can you hear? Okay. Stairway to Heaven. So that is a MIDI player program that I wrote using that interface. And the source code's available if anyone wants to play around with it. But for kids, you want to give them simple Apple soft uh, instructions and have them do their own things with MIDI because it's real easy. Just poke a few registers and learn the commands, and you're doing MIDI. Good, thank you. Very good. Very good.
So I'm talking about errata online and Plato terms. So Plato term is a terminal emulator to connect to an online service for retro computing enthusiasts called errata online. All of this is the work of Thomas Cherry Holmes. So my thanks and apologies at the same time because it deserves much more than five minutes. Uh, so, um, sorry. So what is Plato? Plato is a was a a a mainframe-based or even supercomputer-based learning system developed from the 60s to the 70s, 80s, kind of hit the high point in the 70s. Uh, they developed a plasma display to, to support it and um, was, was used and it, it came out of the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana and um, um, I'm wondering why I'm seeing color here because I killed the color but anyway. Uh, so. Uh, many terminals, term, terminals could hook up to a, a central computer, even over long distances, and uh, primarily used for, uh, it was meant to be used for, for self-paced learning, but ended up becoming uh, a gaming platform and social, and social uh, community platform. Uh, by the early 80s, uh, Atari tried to create a, or did create a, a an emulator for that terminal that we just saw a moment ago, and and they sold that, and it was a uh, very expensive online service, like eight dollars an hour, could be fourteen dollars an hour. So let me show you. Uh, now that uh, terminal emulator has been written in CC65 by Ter Thomas Cherry Holmes, and um, and so now it's been ported to the Apple II. So I'm running an uh, Apple II Plus here, not connected via serial to a TCP server session running. I'm connecting to port 8005. And um, it's a graphical and text terminal, terminal uh, protocol. Is connected at 1200 and I have a login to Atari <laughs> And I'll go to AirFight, which is historically. Uh, oh, crap. Do not win. see that it works so uh, not the entire protocol is is, um, is supported yet but uh, almost all of it is and I will be displaying this uh, on the show and tell on Saturday so answer questions then and let you play around with it so thank you now we have Jay Scott and after that is All right.
right, all right. How many people know what vaporwave is? All right. So here's what happened with me. Um, I collected with from a guy uh, 100 tapes of Kmart uh, music because there was a guy who worked at a Kmart, and what Kmart would do is they'd give him a cassette tape and they put it into this cassette machine, run it for one week, and then they'd throw out the tape. Except he didn't throw out the tape; he took home the tape. So instead, he had all these tapes, so we put them all online. And what really freaked me out was they were all, when he put them all up, he tagged them all Vaporwave. And I was like, well, what's Vaporwave? And that's how I became very old. <laughs> so, um, so this is considered to be the seminal uh, uh, Vaporwave album, the one that really started the, the trend in 2011. It's called uh, Floral Shop. This is the song called Macintosh Plus. And so Vaporwave is a descendant of Chillwave, which was retro synthesizer. And uh, Vaporwave has now been fully superseded by, by Witch House and Sea Punk. So you're really old because you've heard of none of those things. You are also really old because you listen to it and you're like, this is awful. And so the intention behind Vaporwave is to bring back a kind of visualized aesthetic of mall uh, culture of the 1980s. So it's kind of a reference, and it's, what's interesting to me and why I think it's of interest to you is that we do a lot of work here in history and bringing back items and kind of remixing them or working with them. And here is a case where this, in 2011 and so on, these, we, this was a contemporary remix of the impression of what the 1980s and 1990s visual aesthetics are. They put in VCR artifacts, they put in uh, this kind of messed up sound in the background. They play things from commercial pieces, Japanese pop songs. Uh, the videos themselves tend to be like fake VHS collages of this piece. So um, this is the kind of thing I always warn people about when, when we work, like I do with the archives, to collect, I work with the archives, um, to uh, put together all of these different... I actually hear you over there. Really? You know why? Because you're old. All right. <laughs> old person. Turn down the music. His grandpa's getting cranky. All right. All right. Okay, go on. So, so the reason I'm bringing this, the reason I'm bringing this, this, this particular sound up and all that is because it, in, in the efforts that we do to, to kind of organize all of these old materials, is sometimes this belief that these things will have in their own way the full historical context of what they mean, and that's how they'll be ingested by people of a contemporary space for whom they have no direct contact with it. And my experience now has been that that is absolutely not the case, that it becomes just another part off the shelf that represents the previous times, that they then remix into these kind of pseudo-ironic uh, methodologies. So, so one minute. Hmm? One minute. One minute. So, and, and so I bring this up mostly as a mental exercise to realize that it's very good to kind of put together these pieces of history and make them available and to add the context, but to also not be annoyed and perhaps take joy in the fact that people find their own stories within the things that we do, that they look at the, the creations of what we, were really important to us and interpret it almost at a 90 degree angle. Um, this this album is 38 minutes long. It is 38 minutes you will not get back. So <laughs> if you decide to play it, feel free to do it. Uh, I was able to get through about six minutes. So whatever you get more, I guess you get a prize. But I'll know what that prize is. All right, and that's it. Thank you much. Okay, can you hear? Okay, great. Um, so about a month ago, or, uh, I'm kind of a little obsessed with the ca game Castle Wolfenstein from ages ago. Do people know that one or yeah. pretty familiar with it? One of the top ones of the 80s? Okay, good. So I can, I got a familiar audience. <laughs> um, so about a month ago, I was looking around for source code on this, and I would go on the forums and such, and I find like the source code that exists is apparently for a PC, and everybody asking questions about it. Um, says that it doesn't exist, or if it exists, it's for a PC. And I was kind of distressed I couldn't find it, and so of course the rational thing is to basically start writing a disassembler. <laughs> so it's like in, the, in about the past month I took Eclipse and Java, which I know, and start writing a disassembler um, for 6502 and um, the text, the Castle Wolfenstein, in kind of my own image. 
Um, I looked around at disassemblers and I didn't really find that they would do the kind of disassembly I wanted or kind of what I thought I'd want. And so what I tried to do is just treat it as an input stream and then just pipe different bytes in and then mark it off. It's just basically marked up binary stream. And so that's kind of where it is. And so, you know, this is it. And so if I just ran it real quick, this is um, one of the files called at init. And it basically does something like this. It's really rough. I mean, this is like, I didn't even plan really on coming to KFIS <laughs> to show this. But uh, you can see it'll sit there. Even if you don't know assembly language, it's basically taking apart like 6502 here. Then it's taking apart text here. You can see like they've, He's got like DOS commands embedded in here. There's self-modifying code all over the place. And um, that's kind of it. And I started taking apart other things like um, integer basic that has uh, embedded binary at the end that a lot of uh, archivers don't, don't catch. So it's got that kind of stuff too. And that's uh, kind, kind of it. I, I came here as, um, and also Dan here, we, we ended up ironically sitting next to each, or coincidentally sitting next to each other at the first barbecue and then apparently he's looking for somebody to collaborate and I told him I was working on this and he said well I'll put it under version control because it wasn't it wasn't anywhere under version control it's just like I think there are like 73 backups of a folder <laughs> it's a quick and dirty way to back it up and so he said he'll put it under version control and then we're just kind of kicking off um, seeing where this goes and it might be mushrooming into something a little bit bigger. No, yeah. no one has to. Um, that's it. <laughs> no one has to run, no more than one person has to be running this code at any one time. It doesn't get called by any other programs. Uh, not time. yet. Um, we're working on the next incantation of this um, is get some scripting around it. So basically the engine for it is going to be really tight, clean, and then you puppet master it with some higher level stuff on the outside. I was thinking if you were modifying the so, code. Oh, uh, sorry, are we yeah, we're up. I'm sorry. So <laughs> that's that's it. Microphone to him. Okay, great. Oh. Okay. Oh, wait. We're, we're, we're going to do five minutes. Okay. So okay. you have to make sorry. five minutes. All right. There. Oh, perfect. Okay. Thank okay. you. This is Dan. That's Dan. I'm Dan. Can you hear me? Okay. So originally we were going to split it two minutes, three minutes. That worked out really well. Uh, so we sat next to each other. So it was the first Kansas Fest I came to, and uh, you know, one of the things I want to do is I want to collaborate with somebody. And so I, I sat next to Alan, purely by chance, not by irony. Uh, and he says he was working on a Castle Wolfenstein disc. I was like, oh yeah, that was the first game I ever played, and I still have the disc. I love that. So we were going back and forth, and it's like, oh, this is kind of nice. But, you know, there are disassemblers. It's like, well, maybe we can do some other thing. Oh yeah, I already got that too. And it's like, oh, okay. So he could just uh, feed in arbitrary discs dump the files. Here's the different file types. Here's the different disassemblers for the different file types. Like, oh, okay, now this is getting somewhere. Uh, so what we had planned to do, what, what just started as like a common interest, is like we both like the game, we both like digging into things, um, and I'm pretty sure that nobody here has worked on a project completely in isolation. You know, this couldn't have worked out any better. So we, we pretty much, uh, three phases that we wanted to start on this. You know, first is just a tool of discovery. Be able to pop in any disk, any image, within reason, 80-20, and, and just have it give, it give you everything that has about it. Do as much of the heavy lifting as possible with the least amount of effort. And, and so, so first, it's a discovery tool. And, and the second part is, a, is it's a collaboration tool. So everybody in here who's ever worked on a project is, you know, here's all the people I've worked with. Here's all the projects that I've built on. So what we want to be able to do is make it so that built into the system, uh, anybody can collaborate with anybody else, and it, and it preserves your, your work. So as you continue to work on it, or if somebody stops, somebody can pick up where they left off, you can do it remotely, and you can bring your, your combined knowledge together. And then the last part is if you can take it apart, if you can analyze it, wouldn't it be nice if you can reassemble it and then run it? You know, maybe uh, easily add enhancements to existing products, fix bugs. Uh, my personal favorite is the i9 bug in Wizardry. Maybe I won't fix that one. But it would be nice to see what this looks like. It would be nice to have something that removes all the friction that allows you to spend the 
maximum amount of what precious time you have doing what you enjoy most. Thanks. I just wanted to talk about a couple of uh, programming things that didn't go the way I expected and how I um, solved them. When I uh, got my first, it was a part-time job at, when I was in college, which then became a full-time job after I graduated, eventually get, going up to 80 hours a week. <laughs> um, my boss was developing software to teach both the kids in the school as well as the teachers about certain protocols and how to handle certain situations with the kids. And it would have questions and multiple choice answers in a text file. And it would read the text file, put the question up on the screen. But he didn't want words to get split from one line, you know, the part of the word on the end of the line, part of the word on the next, beginning of the next line. So he was parsing the string, finding a space. OK, here's a word. Does it fit? Print it. Next word. Does it fit? Print it. Next word. Does it fit? No. Put it on the next line. And it was working fine, but every once in a while, you'd get word, 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 and it would just stop for anywhere from like three to five minutes. And then it would go again. And we couldn't figure out what was going on. I was pouring through the Apple manuals, because this was in 1981, so there wasn't a Google to <laughs> look up things like that. And I finally figured out that it was, uh, because of all the string manipulations we were doing, it was filling up memory. It was doing garbage collection. So we sim I, f I found the free function, which tells AppleSoft to do garbage collection instead of letting it just go when it runs out. And at a point after each question, where there was a natural place for a pause, put in that command, problem solved. The other issue was when we were um, creating reports for students' standardized test scores. We had a wide format daisy wheel printer, and I was doing bar charts for their scores, and because it was a wide format, it was a simple matter of x equals 1 to whatever their score was and print that many asterisks for the bar. That printer died. We didn't want to get another wide format printer, so we got a regular printer. And the paper's not wide enough for that long a bar anymore. So <laughs> we just need to scale it down 80 to 80% 80 size. So I said, OK, for x equals 1, 2, score times 0.8. It worked for most scores, but some scores, and I can't even remember exactly what the commonality was in, in, in them, but some of the scores, we would just get one asterisk. And I, I tried putting it in parentheses, I tried changing the order of the numbers, you know, score times 0 0.8, 0 0.8 times score. Uh, nothing worked. And finally, when I was telling my brother about it, he said, you tried using an integer function? Telling it integer of score times 0 0.8 fixed the problem. Because apparently when you just say score times 0 0.8, there's a rounding error that pops up with certain values of score that cause it to be negative for between 0 and 1 or something. So for 1 to that number, that's why I was only getting one, one asterisk. Okay. Um, the other thing, the same brother, um, sometime in around 1985, I think, got a Color Computer 3. And he could not stop raving about how fantastic this computer was and how much better it was than my Apple IIe. So, I started taking my Apple IIe over to his house, and we were coming up with various routines. I would write the routine in AppleSoft, he'd write it in his color computer basic, and we would time them. We'd run them side by side, and I'd beat his pants off every single time. <laughs> then he found some poke that was supposed to double the clock speed or something, and I was still beating him. And then I said, you know, if I used integer basic, I could beat you even more. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't like that. There was a game called Degeneration for the developed on the Apple II, um, fortunately never released. Uh, it was intended to be released by Broder Bonds, the developer worked there, uh, but 
ended up going to Software Toolworks, the ones that picked it up eventually, and they handed it off to Mindscape to, to release, who promptly threw it away. <laughs> uh, spent a year developing the PC version, and this is what we ended up with, the slash generation, not the dash generation. Uh, but anyway, the original Apple II version was fully double high res, came on four disk sites, uh, completely RW18 uh, sector format, so a floppy crack uh, would need a fifth side, uh, like the Prince of Persia cracks we saw originally. Uh, I considered doing com a compression uh, to get it back onto the four sides, except that there's a built-in editor. You can edit every element of the game for every level of the room, every uh, room in the, in the game. The game has secrets, secret rooms. In this room you can see there are three switches, but no matter what combination you press them in, only two of the doors will open. The door on the left-hand side is activated by a hidden switch, which I won't actually point out where it is. If you ever play, you can find it for yourself. And there are bugs in the game. This room in particular is likely to crash the game uh, if you were to play it. The issue is that these two uh, enemies, they're known as C generation, uh, there's A, B, C and D generation enemies. Uh, if you shoot either of them when they're too close to a wall, the explosion that's generated uh, produces enough collision events that it overflows a buffer in memory and then eventually the game glitches really badly or just outright crashes. Uh, if you're very careful with your timing, you can shoot the bottom one first when they're right in the middle of the open space uh, and the top one will come chasing you down and then the problem doesn't occur. Uh, another bug is the fact that the floor number that says zero there should actually be a different number entirely. Now the game is obviously incomplete too because the last level looks like that. <laughs> uh, in the PC version there's, a, there's more animation and uh, there's also a, a doomsday timer that's, that runs while the game is running, but in this version of the game, even when the time gets to zero, it just wraps around. They didn't actually have an animation for it. Anyway, uh, instead of doing a floppy version, I uh, made a hard disk version, converted to ProDOS, and as of about an hour ago, I put it on Asimov so Aww. everyone can play. All right. That's it. <laughs> well, let's see. Just a random thoughts or two or a few. The Macintosh is the, could be looked at as the improvement of the Lisa. Could the 2GS be looked at the improvement of the 3? The 3 that nobody, a lot, oh, actually, a lot of people don't think about it. But the Apple 2GS is very much like the Apple 3 in terms of what it's got to build it, what it's got built in, what it's offering you. And it even uses a bit from the Apple III. Prodos was a subset of Apple III's SOS, and GSOS, or Prodos 16, is even more of SOS. So what if the Apple II, I mean, if the Apple III hadn't had gone through the political process of trying not to be an Apple II, would there be an Apple III? I mean, would there be a 2GS? With the, uh, with the Satan mode enabled on a, t on a three and ROMs loaded, you almost have a base of a 2GS without the sound card as it is. So you have to wonder, where would we have been? Where would we have gone? And the Apple III had Business Basic. The 2GS has Apple 2GS Basic that was never officially released. It's the same basic. 
A lot of stuff got brought up and reused. Nothing was wasted. So I always have to wonder if the three hadn't have flopped, would we have the 2GS or would we have an Apple IV? <coughs> Um, so last year, if you were here, you remember my, uh, or the year before, you remember my presentation on uh, Passport, the automated uh, disk verification and uh, copy and cracking utility for Apple II. Um, I have ported it to Python, and you and is available now on GitHub, and you can run it. Uh, it has uh, three basic modes. One is a verify mode, uh, which I will not show you, uh, but just does, you know, verifies that your disk image is good. It takes disk images as input. Uh, everything is now virtualized. There's no real hardware involved. There's not even an emulator involved. Uh, the other thing it can do, um, it can take a, an EDD file, of which I have thousands, and you should not make any more. <laughs> and it will use the passport logic to uh, read the EDD file, find the uh, RWTS, read the disk with its own code, or some appro Python approximation thereof, and output a working copy protected dot was file, which works now in the latest version of virtual 2, uh, 8.4 and above. And we can boot. But wait, there's more. It's passport after all. and it can crack a disk in three seconds. <laughs> that should look familiar if you've ever seen Passport or seen a presentation on Passport. It went through the disk, it found the disk's own RWTS, it found the infamous Eve 7 bit stream of which this t-shirt is, is a visual, um, uh, visual uh, visualization, a visual visualization, oh, ah, never mind. It's the Kansas Festival A's already. Anyway, it found the E7 bit stream and it fixed it. And it found a bunch of the prologues and uh, epilogue bytes and fixed those. And it write, write, writing to summergames.dsk. Crack complete. Okay, so we open summergames.dsk and we have summer games and we have a full version. Uh, a fully cracked version from a .was file, no emulators or hardware involved. Thank you very much, that is all. <laughs>